So another lesson you mentioned is celebrate the win. So how do you do this? How do you, have you learned this? It's definitely not one of my natural skills, by the <laughs> way. So when when we were talking a moment ago about counterbalancing weaknesses, there there's one for you. It's uh, not something I, I naturally go to. Um, yeah, my my head still there's something bigger that we're still working on. Um, but uh, but I've had a lot of team members. And Daria, you were mentioning a moment ago, she she's a great example of this. I've had a lot of team members who bring that skill into the team. They're they are thinking about that, and because of the relationship that I have with them, they're very comfortable telling me, you know, hey, just so you know, we're we're gonna cross a very big threshold, and 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 I recognize that once they. They pointed out again to me, but we're going to cross a big threshold. You know, we, we need to celebrate that. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples, not just trending ideas or buzzword laden schmaltz, real world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. I didn't come up with that, but I love it. That quote is from George Bernard Shaw. And hopefully it's inspiration for anyone trying to make positive change in their organization. I think of that quote while reading a lesson in the podcast guest application for our next guest, change starts here, right? Change starts with me. Different words, same sentiment, because the status quo is tenacious. If you want change to happen, you need to be unreasonable. It needs to start with you. Here to share the story behind that lesson, along with many more lesson-filled stories, is Dan Garcia, the CMO of Providence Blockchain Foundation. Thanks for joining me, Dan. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So I'm just going to go quickly through your background, long, illustrious background, so people understand who I'm talking to, a real change maker in many different industries. Uh, you started your career during the dot-com boom as a marketing specialist at Cosmo.com, went on to be a business in business sales and marketing at Singular Wireless, which is now AT&T Mobility. You're the Interim Director of Marketing and a Marketing Program Manager at Safeco Insurance, Senior Director of Direct Marketing at Travelers Insurance, Head of Direct Marketing of Analytics at Travelocity, which is part of Expedia Group, Senior Director of Global Digital and Analytics at Electronic Arts, Head of Digital Marketing and Analytics for the Americas of BlackRock, VP of Digital Marketing and Digital Product Marketing at Franklin Templeton, and now CMO of Providence Blockchain Foundation. Woo! <laughs> There's a lot, and we're going to unpack that career in this episode for everyone listening, so we can wring as many lessons out of your head to help them with their own campaigns and careers, Dan. Uh, but let's first Chad, take a look at what Providence Blockchain Foundation is. The Providence Blockchain Foundation is a nonprofit organization that supports its public open source blockchain used by 70 financial institutions, including fintechs, banks, and credit unions, more than $15 billion in financial asset transactions have been supported by Providence Blockchain. Providence Blockchain. Uh, and Dan has managed teams as large as 80, up to 12 partners, and budgets as large as $110 million in his career. But right now, he says he is working in a decentralized fashion. So, Dan, give us a sense. What is your day like as CMO, and what does that mean, working in a decentralized fashion? Yeah, no, thank you, Daniel. I appreciate the question. Again, appreciate being here. Um, it's it's a different it's a totally different role from where I started my career. Uh, you know, even the last uh, three years, there, there excuse me, the last five years when I was at Franklin Templeton, just vastly different. Um, most of my career has been about building teams internally and having agency partners that support the goals that you're trying to achieve. Now, where we are today, uh, and particularly in the blockchain web three world. With decentralization, it's about how you harness all the value and power of the community around you. And so very different than having a team of 80 people like I did uh, at the Max at Franklin Templeton. Today, I have a much larger community around me that's supporting all of our marketing messages and activities. And that community includes uh, people who are very interested in what we're doing on the blockchain. So they're, they're they're just interested community members that are following Providence blockchain. 
And then it also includes all the builders and institutions that are using the blockchain. And so you were mentioning 70 plus. Um, some of those are huge financial institutions. So you think about the Apollo Global Management um, or Hamilton Lane. Uh, others are very innovative fintechs like Finclusive or Figure or Oasis Pro. Um, and all of them have marketing teams that uh, are eagerly interested in seeing the blockchain do well and seeing their businesses doing well. So uh, together, I have a, a huge community to be able to collaborate. And it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very different role, uh, but it's a lot of fun having um, all those partners and it does help drive the message a lot further. Um, in terms of day to day, you know, for me, uh, there is a lot of coordination and communication with all those different parties. So I, I do actually spend probably more of my day today just organizing and communicating uh, with those community partners um, around messages and pulling people together um, so that we can create a, lot, a louder voice on certain topics. Um, so I, I do probably over index on, on that more so than I have in the past. Um, and then beyond that, I spend a lot of time writing. Uh, so, you know, as an earlier stage startup, if you want to consider us that, um, you know, getting our message out there and helping educate uh, the, the companies that we're focused on, which is the financial service sector, um, is, a, is a huge part of the role. So there's a ton of time spent there. So those are probably the biggest parts of my day. So 20 years ago, maybe more, I don't know exactly, you know, open source, open source, open source, yeah. we hear about open source. We still hear about open source, of course. Now decentralized, right? This has been a trending term. So are these just different, is it market Is it just different terms for the same thing? Or are there true differences as a CMO in how you approach open source or and decentralized? It's totally different. So I think, I think open source, you know, refers to the idea that you can borrow and leverage or contribute to things that um, might be useful to others or, or useful to your, your own company. And so, um, you know, largely that term has been used in a sense of um, open source for sharing ideas or collaborating on a, uh, an idea or for sharing software, probably more so for sharing software. It's probably more common vernacular there. Um, decentralized, it's a, it's a wild thing. You know, and, and for, for me, it took me a minute to even get my head around it. You know, Providence Blockchain Foundation, we don't own a blockchain. Actually, there's no one entity that owns Providence Blockchain, which is kind of cool. It's also a little different. Um, it's a community that owns it, right? So it's all the people that participate on that blockchain or own stake in that blockchain. That's the owning community around it. And so, um, you know, when there's decisions that need to be made, on the blockchain, it's that full community that makes the decision, right? It's not it's not one party, one centralized party, uh, as it is in most companies. So so I think I think that's maybe where you see the the differences. And for me, you know, as a marketer, one of the 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 chief things I need to be very sensitive to is not saying own or manage or we decide. Um, instead, it's you know we catalyze, we support, we help. Right. Um, these are probably the, the words that end up uh, being pulled into a lot of our messaging. But yeah. Yeah. Those are me the chief differences. And Dan corrected me in the intro because I was going to say about how Providence Blockchain Foundation manages. You know, he's like, no, 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 you got it all wrong. It's, it's not like that. We catalyze, we support, we don't we don't manage. So uh, but let's take a look at, as we mentioned, you have a long and illustrious career as a change maker. Uh, let's take a look at lessons from some of the things you made. It's a cool thing we get to do as marketers. You know, I've never had another career. I've never been a podiatrist or an actuary or anything else or a blockchain builder, but we get to make things. We get to make things. So let's look at some lessons uh, we can learn from things you made. Your first lesson is progress beats perfection. How did you learn this lesson? Yeah, so, you know, my whole career has been about, to your point, digital transformation. I started um, my career with Cosmo.com. And I was still going to school. I couldn't miss the dot-com boom. So I moved all my classes to evening classes. And I went out and I found a job. And um, the one I happened to find was at Cosmo.com, which uh, anybody that wants to go back and read about it, it was an important dot-com at that time, delivering products from the internet to your door in under an hour. And it was anything from video rentals to convenience items. Um, so for me, uh, you know, getting that, 
having that dot com bug, right? That that bug of digital transformation and what digital transformation could mean, that set my whole career in motion. And so a lot of the roles I came into, there was that digital practice. There there weren't digital tools. Actually, it was quite the opposite. Most of the roles I came into, that's what they desired and they wanted it immediately. And so, um, you know, I, I would say the first 20 years of my career, that's what I did. I went into companies like Safeco Insurance, like you were mentioning earlier, um, you know, Travelers Insurance, where I, I helped, I was part of the co-founding team of their direct-to-consumer business. I went into Electronic Arts, where um, they needed to build out a digital business. Analysts were calling Electronic Arts a grandfather's gaming company um, because they were new Facebook gaming companies that were starting to take a lot of interest and, and drive revenue. Um, so in all these roles, I had to start with, with not very much um, and often not a team and, and often very little budget and to build something in. And so, you know, there's, I think for me, one of the, the kind of impactful ones that I could share with the audience was around uh, what, what we did at Electronic Arts. You know, the, the key starting point for a lot of these things was to have a vision, have a vision for what it was that we wanted to achieve, what it needed to look like. Um, and then from there, starting to back out to what were the steps that got us there. And, you know, in, in the case of electronic arts, you know, one of the things that we wanted, of course, was to have a large digital revenue, <laughs> a digital revenue that countered our console sales and stores, right? That, that's of course what you want. Um, but then the question becomes, well, how do you get there? And starting to back out of that, wind this large revenue and knowing what that number was that we want to hit, um, we started looking at, well, okay, well, what channels could get us there? And at that time, as I was mentioning a moment ago, you know, Facebook was one of those channels where there were certain companies like Zynga seeing a lot of revenue. And so that just seemed like, oh, a natural, you should go build there because, you know, there's revenue to be had. Um, but actually, as we start to back out, we realized uh, the economics of the Zynga business weren't as strong as we would need them to be. We also recognized that the terms, Zynga was grandfathered into some very particular terms that we were going to have access to. So that made it even a little less desirable. Um, so anything that we had already started building in Facebook, I wound down very quickly so that we could put resources elsewhere. Uh, the second thing that we looked at was mobile. We realized that mobile could be uh, a channel that um, could drive a lot of daytime engagement. So like if you think about a gamer who's at the office and wants to you know, do something with this game, but we also realized that that wasn't going to be prolonged gaming time. You know, it was going to be these these momentary spurts of interaction, right? Where you know maybe in the case of a sports game, they're um, you know training their players or uh, making a purchase of a player or something like that. But it probably wasn't going to be full, high quality, intensive games, right? Um, and so that kind of brought us back to the console. The console was where the best quality you know, the highest quality games could be played and probably where people would have the longest duration of gameplay. And so knowing that, that those two were probably going to be the two primary channels, but knowing that console was going to be extremely important, the question became, well, okay, how does that become digital? And there were two aspects to that. One was, well, we can sell um, things digitally, like, you know, you could buy a player, right? Or, you know, um, buy a skill. So there could be those microtransactions, um, but even that would take time to grow revenue, right? There, there would need to be um, new, new, new um, components of games built um, that take a lot of time and a lot of resources to do. Um, so there, there was though a lower hanging opportunity. It was just a hard opportunity to get to, which was, could we move to digital day and date download of games? So day and date is the day that a game gets released in source. Um, nobody, and why I say nobody, I, I mean retailers, of course, didn't want to see that. And uh, Xbox and Sony at that time were not interested in, in doing that because of the potential of losing uh, share inside of retail. 
Um, so there was one of those things that everybody wanted to stay away from, but there was a recognition that getting there was going to be very important. And so for us, we backed down then another level. Well, what are things that we could do today that would start to soften those barriers and give us a, a path to, to being able to get there eventually? And the thing that we had come up with was this program called EA Sports Season Ticket. It was a, a subscription program that allowed uh, players who wanted to sign up for the program to download the game three days before it came out in retail. And yes, there are players who are that passionate about games that would want to do that. Download games three days before it came out in retail to be able to start playing the game earlier to build up your skills, build up your teams for online play. Um, and anything that you did during those uh, three days would uh, carry over once you bought the game in retail. So once you bought the game and put put the disc in the console, everything that you had done during those three t days would, would carry over with you. And then we would also give you some discount on microtransactions to help encourage you to do more of that. Um, that program did amazing. Actually, it became a whole division within EA. It became the origin division. Um, and I, I believe it was about six, maybe seven months later, we actually got to the first day and date digital download where we had a game now uh, available to download on your console. So that was a little bit of a wild ride for us, but it was a ton of fun. Um, and, and that kind of played into this idea of, you know, we'll need to have perfection immediately. Let's just have progress, right? Let, let's take this down to a level that we know we can achieve today that's going to give us a path to being able to grow a business that we know is going to be extremely crucial for us as a company. And it allowed us to also be a market leader. We were the ones that drove that change. So take us through the, the internal communication aspect that as a marketer, what's the internal communication aspect that goes along with that? Because when we think of digital transformation, sometimes we just think of technology, right? Yep. But I love what you did in the sense, because I can imagine going there, it could be like, okay, Zynga's eating our lunch, you know, we're getting, we're getting all those flack from Atlas. We need to bring someone in. We need to make this change now, you know, but you did something very smart, right? You backed up and you didn't say like, okay, let's be the second or third or fourth Zynga, right? Let's look at the market. Let's find where can we have some exclusivity? Cause that is going to give us a powerful and sustainable value proposition, but doing that with that pressure, I'm sure there was a time urgency pressure of they're like, let's get this guy in there. Let's ramp this up. Let's get going. Zynga's beating us every quarter. Like doing that requires some internal communication skills and finesse. So do you have any tips on anyone out there running a digital transformation, that internal communication that's necessary? I, th I think the first is getting people to believe in a vision and, and numbers help do that, right? I think when you can put numbers down on paper and say, look, Here's a path that looks like it should be the right path, but when you look at the the, the model, the forecast and model behind it, it's not going to get us anywhere. And then, you know, conversely, here's a couple other paths that look interesting. One of them also seems like a natural fit mobile, but could we really see that um, holding the integrity and the quality of the gameplay that we want players to have? No, that's an easy answer. We we don't even need numbers for that. And then third, you know, you can look at console and know that we were we were a leader in console gameplay. So, you know, transitioning out of that just felt very unnatural. And they could realize and see through the revenue that we already had that that would be an easier path to to go. It just had a very steep uh, initial hurdle on it. And um, the other thing that I would say about console that made it very interesting is there were there were two issues to uh, this. One was um, to prep all the discs for print. They, uh, the games typically had to go to um, to a third party, and there was some risk for piracy tied to that. And then the the second risk that sat or the second issue that sat in there was um, printing discs and shipping them also cost money. And so if you know you could shave off the money of printing the disc and um, reduce the um, the risk of the piracy, those were also two huge side benefits to the business. Um, so. Yeah, I think getting people to align on a vision is the first thing. And uh, I was very fortunate. You know, I had, there was a very eager management team. I had a, a very talented counterpart that ran the technology of that, of EA Sports Digital, um, who was a, also a very vocal uh, leader there. 
Um, and I think together with a very strong leadership team, we were able to get some alignment around what we needed to do. The hardest conversation in there was pulling off of Facebook. Just, it didn't feel right giving, look at Zynga's business. But I, I think after a few weeks of having the conversation, going back to numbers, um, and then also realizing gameplay quality wouldn't be there either, be like mobile. Uh, I think we we finally crossed that hurdle and got comfortable there. And that's also focusing on what your customer needs better gameplay than instead of yeah. on the competition, which is hard <laughs> because like we're so competitive, right? Uh, but so you mentioned uh, you came in very early to a lot of these digital transformations. You were maybe the first guy. They didn't even have a team yet. And you said one lesson you learn when hiring is to counterbalance weaknesses. So how do you do this when you're building your team? You know, I, I was... Uh, really fortunate to start um, my leadership career very, very young. I started it at the age of 26 at Safeco. Um, I uh, was hired in by a Maisie marketing leader who um, ended up leaving about nine months after I was hired to go be the CMO of uh, one of uh, one of the entities of the Hartford. And when she was leaving, um, she, you know, there, she had an org underneath her. When she was leaving, she um, told the CMO that I was the natural person to step up and lead that team, uh, which was a huge honor, also very scary. You know? And it, it, it took me a while when he first approached me and asked, you know, hey, do you want to take this role? It took, took me a minute to say yes, because, you know, I had a, a very talented team around me who were more senior who have been in insurance much longer, who have been marketers much longer. Um, so it did t- take me a minute to accept the role, but I'm very happy I did. One, one of the, the things um, that we were able to accomplish in that role is uh, gaining recognition for uh, what we're contributing to the bottom line of the business. We're running um, some very, um, very valuable incentive programs that were driving uh, growth and markets where we had previously had a much smaller footprint. And because of that uh, work that we're doing around the incentive programs, I was able to start to build up a, a stronger team around particularly that pocket of work. Um, and I needed to hire quite a few people into that. Uh, previously, it had been me and one other person. So, you know, we needed to create an actual team that was going to do that and, and uh, increase the scope of that program. Um, when I when I first started, and again, this was the first time that I was hiring talent, when I first started hiring talent into that group, into that team, uh, it was it seemed like just the right idea. You you hire the best CV that comes across, and the person who interviews well, you know, communicates well and feels like a good team fit, right? That seems like it checks all the boxes. And it did. For that team, it totally did. I, I had a great team built out there that continued to drive that program, built it up to a, a much broader program than than I originally had it. Um, so yeah, that totally worked. Great, great um, check, check mark there. But, uh, but the thing that I realized as I looked across that team was that I had a lot of great people there but I was still missing things that counterbalanced me being a great leader. And, um, and so I, I took that away from that role. And when I went to Travelers, I again had to build out a team. And Travelers brought me into, in, in the very first role, build out their interactive marketing team. So they were still sending faxes. They didn't have a, an email program in place. They, um, they had a... a of a fairly basic website uh, that needed to be completely retooled. Um, there, they still sold at the time through independent agents, and there there was no environment for independent agents to go get collateral, particularly digital collateral that they could give to their clients. Um, so there were just there was just a lack of interactive tools, and so I needed to build up a team there to help me create that. And and I'm always eager to to move quickly. So, uh, so for me, it was very important that we start to see some success uh, in the first 12 months, you know, brand new website, having an email program, uh, that gave optionality to doing fast faxes, um, and, and having a toolbox for all of our agents. And so, um, when I start to do the hiring, instead of going hard after people with the best CV who, um, you know, 
shined uh, in, in terms of their discipline. I instead decided that I was going to go hire all the people that I felt solved for where I wasn't strong. So I didn't hire actually anybody, not one person with a digital background or any sort of digital background uh, into that role. I instead went, I hired one person that I thought was exceptionally detail oriented, which counterbalanced one of, one of my weaknesses, somebody who was exceptionally detail oriented, who had a, a project management background because I would again, want to move very, very quickly. And I couldn't miss something along that, particularly managing a brand new team. So I went and hired a person like that. Um, I went and hired somebody who. Uh, came out of the IT leadership uh, management training program, brought them in because they understood technically how everything worked. Uh, and I like to think of myself as being a very technical business leader, um, but this was a person that really understood exactly how everything worked and how everything would need to connect and could be somebody that could interface with the technology team very seamlessly for me and had those relationships already internally. So that just gives you an example. They, these were the sort of people that I was bringing into the group. Um, and and we were hugely successful. The uh, At the end of that year, so my goal was at the end of the year to have those three things in place, operational. Um, and at the end of that year, uh, one of the senior vice presidents came up to me uh, who ran um, uh, sales and marketing for personal insurance, the division I was in, uh, came up to me and said, you know, hey, Dan, when uh, before we hired you, every and every year we go through and we grade all the areas of the business, red, green, red, yellow, or green. And, uh, you know, personal insurance in general was yellow, which means we, in all the areas of personal insurance, most of them were yellow, which means that we feel we're in lockstep with competitors and um, we're making the right investments, um, and uh, and and we we feel generally good about where we're going. He said there was the one red, and the red was we didn't have any interactive marking capabilities, and we felt way behind uh, some of the others. And uh, and this year there was one green, and it was interactive marking. That was only green in personal insurance. And so I just want to commend you. We as a team went from uh, red all the way to green inside of 12 months. Um, and that, that actually was, uh, was a pivotal turning point for me and several of the team members. We ended up joining a small group of folks that were starting to think about um, the direct-to-consumer business. And so that, that then got into the, the co-founding of that business. But yeah, well, that's, that's good. That is an example of change and transformation, going from the red to the green. Uh, but let me ask you, so you know, I, I think this is a great approach. You're trying to balance out you know, the weaknesses on the team. I would imagine this varies across all the different roles you've had. But I wonder if you've seen any commonalities in the best hires you've made, either in how you recruited them or in them themselves and how you interviewed, anything like that. And I'll mention a few of the great hires that, that you're really proud of. Uh, you mentioned Anna Dix, now an independent consultant. Mickey Newberger, now CMO at Realtor.com, Lee Rosenthal, now VP at HPS Investments, Daria Odom, uh, now at Securitize. Uh, so just thinking of all those kind of folks you hired, your best hires, was, was there any commonalities we could learn from how you recruited, how you interviewed, how you hired uh, them, you know, any commonalities in general? Yeah, there's there's another component. It's, uh, it's not only um, them filling you know, counterbalancing your own weaknesses so that you can have a strong team. Um, it's also finding people that you can very easily work with. And so for me, a lot of those folks that you mentioned, I still keep in regular contact with, um, you know, Daria worked with me at three different companies. Um, Anna and I have collaborated at multiple companies. Uh, I hired her at Traveler. So when I was mentioning somebody that was very detail oriented, who was a very strong project manager, she's went on to have, have a very, uh, great career in, uh, marketing, but that's not where she came out. She came out of project management. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's finding those people that again, not only help counterbalance your weaknesses, but also, um, are people that you 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 generally want to work with and can build that tight relationship with. So you make a change, like you said, red to green, these, these big transformations. Change is hard. Transformation is hard, right? So another lesson you mentioned is celebrate the win. So how do you do this? How do you, have you learned this? 
definitely not one of my natural skills, by the <laughs> way. So when when we were talking a moment ago about counterbalancing weaknesses, there there's one for you. It's uh, not something I I naturally go to. Um, you know, my my head still there's something bigger that we're still working on. Um, but uh, but I've had a lot of team members, and Daria, you were mentioning a moment ago, she she's a great example of this. I've had a lot of team members who bring that skill into a team. They're they are thinking about that, and because of the relationship that I have with them, they're very comfortable telling me, you know, hey, just so you know, we're we're going to cross a very big threshold, and 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 I recognize that once they they point it out again to me, but we're going to cross a big threshold. You know, we we need to celebrate that, and um, and and hearing that over and over and over again, I've become much more sensitive to it over time, and it has become something that I do particularly now or the last few years try to drive in myself, opposed to <laughs> hoping somebody somebody tells me tells me. Um, but uh, but it, it's important to do it because it it does a few things, uh, and I've seen much better teams because of it. You know, one. It's a time just to uh, take a step back and as a group bond, right? You know, we, we did something together as a team and, you know, it was a hard thing that we did, right? And it may not be that we exactly reached the, the full vision, right? It could just be that we took a first step towards that vision, but it was a milestone step. And um, taking that step back gives us that chance to breathe and, and, and sit down as a team and bond. Um, so it's really important on that level. It also uh, ends up being a moment of celebration for uh, for us to show the leadership team, because you know often you're you're working so hard, and sure you can show numbers, and you know leadership team can generally be happy that you're moving along the right path, and and that you're you're hitting the milestones that you've agreed to. Um, but when you take a step back to celebrate, it just feels bigger, right? And it feels maybe a little abnormal in a sense, right? And so it allows them to also take a step back and give more recognition to you as a team. And so in a lot of companies I've been at, you know, I, I extend that celebration to my leadership because then they get to be part of it too. And they now have some ownership in it. They have an opportunity to stop and also celebrate. And it also leaves them with a feeling of, wow, this is a team that's pretty well oiled and working very well together because, you know, clearly we see them bonding strongly. We see them achieving great results and, uh, and they, they all seem very happy and excited by what they're doing. So yeah, it's a, it was, it's been a very important lesson. I'm very, very fortunate that I've had, um, some, um, some folks working alongside me that have kept me, you know, owned that step. In, in a very, very important step and us achieving milestones. So I, yeah, it's, yeah. So how do you choose what to celebrate? Cause I worry sometimes we talk about celebrating the win. It's overly focused on the company. Like, oh, we hit a certain financial metric mm -hmm. or something like that. Right. But for example, when we've interviewed, uh, 20, we surveyed 2,400 us consumers. And one of the things we asked them was about customer first marketing. Only 5% said it wasn't important to them, right? They, they want this feeling that the company's putting the customer first, right? And there, there's other characteristics. We want our team. We want experimentation. We want curiosity. We want all of these things. So how do you choose what to celebrate, right? Is it, is it just the financials? Is it just a certain numbers of benefit the company? Or how can we like instill these other good characteristics into our teams? You, you know, to be honest with you, actually, I think I've celebrated the numbers fewer times. Oh. In my career, you, the the numbers are important, and obviously they're 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 important for the business. They're you know important for for uh, for earning bonuses and and uh, and and for for the 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 team having success. But the things particular to digital transformation that we've celebrated more are milestones of of crossing a hurdle that that felt kind of big, right? So. For instance, um, one of the celebrations that we had at Travelers was we, um, you know, personal lines when I joined Travelers was not the biggest division. Uh, commercial lines was. And uh, the website was run by a committee. So there was a committee of decision makers who determined what went on the website, what the homepage of the website looked like, and it looked like a quilt when I started. 
And uh, the bigger businesses had a larger section on the homepage and the smaller businesses had a smaller section on the homepage, but it was kind of patchy. And so when I arrived, one of the arguments I presented to that committee was this idea that um, the, the, the ownership of the website should be managed by the, the, where the traffic's coming from. And I was able to peel back all the numbers and show that, you know, the vast majority of the traffic that came to the website came from personal insurance, which would be logical and make sense. But it kind of flipped that whole committee on its head. And, uh, and it took several weeks to do that because, of course, this has been a process for a long time of how the website's managed and who's this 27-year-old kid who's coming in with the CMO of personal insurance to share that thought. Um, so, but, but over a little bit of time, I not only showed the numbers, but I showed a vision for how it would work and ensuring that, um, commercial insurance still had, uh, the right presence on the site and that it was easily navigatable to all the things that were important to them. Um, and so over a little time, I gained, uh, that appreciation from that group and was given the license to take temporary ownership of the site to do what needed to be done while everybody saw how things played out. That was a milestone. That was a hard milestone to get to. And and that was as I was just starting to bring on the team. And that was a milestone that the CMO, me, and the first couple of hires I had on the team all took a step back to celebrate. Um, those, those are examples of the sort of things I think require just a minute to take a breath. And, and there's obviously some wins that are really big, like when we got to day and date for electronic card, that's very big, right? So you, you have a very big celebration. That one that I just shared about travelers, you know, it was it was a very important one, very important milestone. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a big one. It wasn't visible to anybody, right, uh, outside of that committee, um, but it was still an important one. So we didn't celebrate as hard as we would for, for the others, but it was still a moment of step back. That's interesting. That's interesting. That's great. You know, a lot of times it's just, boom, there's the numbers are up on the wall. Let's hit those numbers and boom, let's celebrate. I like that. Uh, well, it also brings up that, you know, we as marketers, the first half of the podcast, we talk about the things we made, but also we make them with people. We celebrate with those people, right? And so in the second half of the podcast, we're going to talk about lessons we learned from the people you collaborated with. But first, I should mention that the How I Made It in Marketing podcast is underwritten by MechLabs Institute, the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. You can get 10,000 marketing experiments working for you with MechLabs AI. To get MechLabs AI, sign up for a free trial to the AI Guild at mechlabs.com slash AI. That's M-E-C-L-A-B-S dot com slash AI. Okay, Dan, as I mentioned, you know, we get to make things with people. We, and we learn a lot of lessons from these people. So the first person that you mentioned that you learned from was Gary Schmidt. And you said Gary taught you to network every day. How did Gary teach you this? You, you know, uh, Safeco was in a very interesting spot when uh, I was hired in. I mentioned that, you know, the the leader that brought me in, Kathy Hawkins, uh, incredible human, um, when she left, she recommended me to step up into that role. Uh, at, there was a brief moment in there where underneath the CMO, I was the highest ranking marketer in, in, you know, in terms of level inside of Safeco. And I was 26 years old. And um, and there was an individual who was uh, brought in um, to uh, help the marketing team as it was going through some some broader transition. And uh, the individual that was brought in was Gary Schmidt. And he uh, had been... Uh, marketing agencies uh, early in his career, and then he was a CMO of a, of a, a bank, a, a regional bank. Um, then he got into being a CMO of a larger bank. Um, anyway, he uh, he was hired in as a consultant to uh, help with the marketing organization as it was going through that that change. And I got to know Gary pretty well because he sat in a lot of the senior meetings, uh, you know, even the CEO staff meetings, uh, which I was invited to. And with Gary, one of the the he he had a, a great way about him. He he was a very relaxed uh, leader who uh, was able to inject the right amount of uh, of um, of um, calm and difficult situations. So there was a lot that I took away from Gary, but there were, there was a very particular uh, thing that he had shared with me. He had um, pulled me aside one day and he, he 
again, I was very, very young, so still learning quite a bit. Uh, still, I'm still learning a lot, <laughs> but I, back in those days, I was learning everything. Um, and so uh, he pulled me aside and he said, you know, hey, I can see you being uh, a president of a company one day. You know, you, you have a great posture and you're a good leader. Um, there's one thing that I would recommend to you, though, is that you take a pause from your day job a little bit and you go network. And he said, spend 20% of your workday networking. And that blew my mind because I was thinking, wow, you know, 20, 20, that's a lot of time. I got a lot of work to do. I don't know if yeah. you know, I take 20% of my time and go network. I'm, I'm already busy. I'm working way into the evenings. And, um, and so anyway, he, he said that to me and, um, I also naturally, it's another thing, you know, I'm a little bit of a closet introvert. So naturally for me to, go network is not a very comfortable idea at face value. And so I also just didn't extend myself um, naturally in that way. Um, but what he said did hit me. And I, I did look up to Gary you know, again for, for the reasons I was sharing a moment ago. And so I've, I've taken that feedback with me. And again, it's still not a natural thing for me. So I'm still, I have, as a human, I haven't, I haven't totally morphed into a different human. So I, I still am a closet introvert. Um, but I do push myself now intentionally, right? So when I'm in situations um, where I can network, I push myself into it uh, more. And uh, and then I actively go seek opportunities to network and talk to others I ordinarily wouldn't. Um, and it's brought some fortunate things my way. There's been opportunities that um, I wouldn't have been cued in on if I hadn't been doing that. Um, and so it's opened some doors in terms of possible career options. Uh, it's, uh, it's led to some collaborations I wouldn't have otherwise uh, planned to do or thought of. Um, and so it's, it's been a valuable tool for me. Um, and yeah, I, you know, thank Gary for <laughs> taking, taking the time to pull me aside to make that comment. It's not something I would naturally thought of. Well, what's something you do to network that works for you? Because I am also very introverted. <laughs> you know, so I see some people that I uh, like a bunch of LinkedIn posts. I'll go to some networking party. For me, actually, I read there was a Sports Illustrated reporter. I wish I remember who it was that died. And in the obituary, they mentioned how he was very introverted. And he became a reporter because it gave him a reason to talk to people and interview people and, and have these deep conversations. And that really resonated with me. I never thought about it before, but I love doing this because I would never like approach you, Dan, on, on the street or, or like some mixer or something like that. But getting to sit down and pick your brain for an hour, I just, you know, loving it. So interviewing works for me, right? But uh, well, what, what worked for you as an introvert too? Because I'm an introvert. Like, how do you network? Yeah, I think it's putting yourself in those environments where there's an opportunity to network with the type of people that you may want to network with. So, you know, whether it's going to an event and, um, you know, taking time to, walk up to people. So for instance, if, if I'm not speaking at an event and I'm sitting, uh, listening to a panel, uh, and somebody says something interesting on the panel, I, I try to catch up with them afterwards, right. And spend a little bit of time chatting with them. I do much better personally in one-on-one. -on -one, so I do try to find that one-on-one -on -one way to engage somebody. Um, similarly, when I'm walking through an exhibit hall, it's looking at people's name badges. And if I see a company or I see a person that I've heard the name or, or the, the company that I'm familiar with, and I, I'm interested in hearing what's going on there, I do stop the person and, and, and have a conversation with them. Um, you yeah, know, so it's normally those sort of things that allow me to, you know, network one-on-one -on -one with people where I do best. Um, similarly, if, if I'm in a company, which I'm not right now, that has a cafeteria, you know, it's the same sort of thing, right? I mean, you know, you, you maybe see somebody every day, take a moment, go, go chat with them, right? You, you may learn something. Yeah. So I mentioned this in the opening. I love this. You say change starts here. You learned this from Bill Ryan. Like when we talk about all the change management and all the digital transformations you've had in your career, like I feel like these have become buzzwords. We get used to them. It's like, oh, you know, change management, digital transformation. We, we can't forget. If it's hard, this is hard stuff. The status quo is tenacious. Just try changing what you have for breakfast every morning. Or something, you know what I mean? Like, so wear a different pair of shoes. See what that's like. It's this is big, hard stuff. A lot of people are involved. So you really do have to get, you have to make that happen. So how did Bill push you to do that? And why do you call that change starts here? 
he he said something. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of moments in my career where and my life in general where people say things that just like stick to my core, right? And he said something that just stuck to my core. One day I was uh, in his office. We were having a conversation about um, something that I was working on, and um, and I, I was sharing with him. You know, the travelers like a lot of big companies. You know, big company has a culture. Um, there's people that have been there a long time that have been driving a culture a certain way, and uh, and sometimes that's a little counter to the way that change may need to happen. And um, I think, again, being very early in my career especially, but I think at that time uh, when I was talking to Bill, you know, my, my perspective was, you know, hey, I need to orient myself towards the way that they're doing things so that I can make change from within, right? So if I'm, if I'm part of that um, environment, I can help change it. Otherwise, you know, it feels like, you know, it's, it's going to be a very hard nut to crack. And, uh, and, and Bill's comment was, no, <laughs> you just got to go be the bull in the China shop on that one. Right. And you, you know, the change has to start here with you right now. It can't wait three months for you to build those relationships. You, you just got to go crack that nut. And, um, and it, it was impactful to me because, it, you know, he, you know, in one, one sense, uh, he was the vice president at, at, um, at Travelers when I joined and had been there for a little bit and kind of understood the, the culture and the organization. Um, and so when he made that comment to me, it, it, in a sense, gave me a little bit of license, right? But um, it also, uh, to the comment I was sharing a moment ago, just stuck to my core in defining this, um, this realization for me that and hey, there might be some times where you strategically do uh, pull back and 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 slowly work on something, but there's other times where it needs to happen. And you know, particularly if I'm driving digital transformation, it just needs to happen. And we're, we got to get there. And there's and it doesn't just add on to that point. It doesn't need to be a confrontational thing where you know your relationship with those people needs to be at odds with what you're trying to drive. You know, you can make both things come together, both ends meet, but, um, but it does need to be that what, what needs to get driven happens, right? That that's what the business needs. That's the right thing for the business. Well, so I mean, what you're talking about, I agree with, but it's such an uncomfortable human dynamic, like you're saying, yeah. right? Cause you're going in there just shaking things up and, and sometimes things are a certain way because there's like certain stakeholders that want to keep them that way. So is there ever a time when there's like a small change you can start with that will have a big result. It's not just making a small change for the sake of it. But when you're talking about a digital transformation, there, that's big. There's a lot that can go on there. You can be moving systems and processes and all this. Sometimes we can identify that small change, that low hanging fruit that has an outsized impact. And then kind of, you know, we build momentum for it. Because one of the most popular articles I write about, you know, in, in Martin Sherpa is a small change is big results. People love to see that. Like, oh, I changed three words on a button. I got a 200% lift, whatever, you know. Um, so for you, can you think of any like small change, but boom, it got a big result. And now you're starting to snowball and build that momentum in the organization. Yeah. You know, it is getting to those very small things that feel, um, like not hard thresholds across, right. Or feel very difficult to argue no to, right. You know, so like, uh, one, one, or, or, or even giving people the optionality and letting things play out over time. You know, one great example at Traveler's fast faxes were still very important to some, some people inside the company. I understand it, right? You know, it's the way it's been done. It works, right? The client's been receiving information that way. Um, there's a, a cost to doing it and it, it is becoming a more data way of doing things at that time, but you know, it, it was still working in that moment. And, uh, and so there were a lot of people that were very resistant to move over to email, understandably so. And um, so one of the, the concepts I had come up with was, uh, and I had a great agency partner, uh, uh, um, Eula Sheffield, uh, who helped with this concept. Um, but one of the concepts I had come up with was, what if we just let the client pick, right? So like, what if they had a management center on in this toolkit that we built and they can go in there and decide all the different communication types, how they want to receive it. 
So if they want to receive by fax, fine. And I'll even automate the faxes for the sales team. Nobody has to send them. Nobody has to go sit down at a fax machine and send these things anymore. I'll automate it. Uh, so we'll let people pick fax. We'll let them pick SMS. So at the time, that was maybe a new uh, communication channel that would take off. But we'll let them pick. I'm sorry, um, not SMS. Uh, I'm, for, I'm forgetting. But it was a, a feed that you you could receive at any rate. Uh, we'll we'll let a, essentially a syndication feed. We'll let them choose to receive it that way, or um, or they can receive it by email. And we'll just get, let people be owners. And it doesn't matter whatever they feel comfortable with. Um, the vast majority, of course, picked email. Um, so you know it it ended up transitioning that way. And I highly doubt that they still have those man, those options in the profile management any longer. Um, but, um, but that was a way to get everybody over the hurdle, you know, Hey, I'll on me, I'll take the work off of your plate and we'll just let the customers choose. And, you know, if they've already been receiving facts, we'll continue to do it that way until they choose the way that they want to do it. Yeah. I mean, that is a great way to handle it. Let the customer decide. AB testing is another great way to, uh, you know, let the customer decide. Um, when we talk about this change, you know, sometimes the words in which we use make such a big difference in how people view things. So a famous political example, I'm not going to say what side I'm on, but you know, you could call it offshore drilling or you can call it energy exploration. It's the same thing, but those words change how people see it. Uh, I'm a writer, so I love this last lesson from you. Words matter. You learned this from Ernie Jurek. How did you learn words matter? You, I was super fortunate. So I, I mentioned at the, the top of, um, at the top of the podcast that, uh, I started my career at Cosmo.com, and um, and I switched my classes, evening classes. Um, at that time, it was hard to hire talent because there, the dot-com boom was happening. Um, and uh, and the, the regional marketing organization for Cosmo, for, for the Northwest, um, the, the head of that team, she, uh, she, she got lucky in the sense that um, one of the, the women that worked in our operations group, her, her dad had been a copywriter at some huge agencies. I, I forget which which ones he was at, but they were very large agencies. Uh, had been um, notif- notable for writing some uh, copy that we've all seen on on TV as children. Um, he uh, he offered to come out of retirement to to work with us, and uh, and it just so happened that I got to sit across from Ernie, and so. Uh, one of the jobs that I had was, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it was a video, you know, we did video rentals, convenience items, all these things delivered from the internet to your door in under an hour. And, um, and what, one of the ways that you got the videos back to Cosmo was that there were drop boxes, uh, conveniently located throughout your town. And, uh, typically those would be in restaurants, corner st- stores, apartment building lobbies, um, large office buildings. And somebody had to call to get those owners to agree. And uh, being, you know, very early on in my career there, I was nominated as uh, the perfect choice to, to go do that. And so uh, so I, I got the, the opportunity to call. And, you know, um, you know it's a, it was a very important thing for the business because obviously having these very strategically located was critical because that made people feel that it was truly convenient. Right. Otherwise, it played against our mission if it wasn't convenient. So, um, so I, I did take a lot of pride in making sure that we we're being thoughtful about where these ended up, and um, and and making sure that they were set up in easy to find locations, et cetera. Um, Ernie would sit across, as I mentioned, he sat across from me. He would listen to me calling up the the stores, right, to talk to the owners about this idea. Hey, can we borrow a little corner at the front of the front door? And, um, and there was a whole sales pitch that went along with it. But as I would talk, I would randomly see him glaring at me. And then I would get off the call. Sometimes he would say, say, you know, Hey, (laughs) but when I get off the call, he would tell me, you know, Hey, you know, you, you said, you said this, why don't you say this? And, and, you know, at at the moment when he would say, wow, I mean, one word, the other word. But the more that I would reflect on what he was sharing with me, I, I understood where he was coming from, you know, that he was tightening up a sales pitch 
that should go much smoother. I mean, it, it, it was already going fine, but it should go much smoother and uh, hopefully alleviate more questions or not introduce the opportunity for questions and, uh, and, and get things to a close faster, right? The end of the call quicker. Um, and so I, I always valued, um, you know, I'm particularly looking back, I really value, I, I valued that feedback that he was giving to me. And I, I brought that into the calls uh, at that time. But now as I write copy, it's, uh, it's very intentional, the words I pick and I do it um, to solve for those exact things I was sharing a moment ago, uh, or to bring people along a storyline much, much better than it would otherwise come across. I wonder about words in an emerging industry where people don't even know, or they're not always clear on what the things even are yet, right? Because I think back for an example, many years ago, we surveyed uh, our audience of marketers about conversion optimization. It's kind of what it's called now. And we're asking, well, what do you even call this? And there are you know, many different words. It's pretty evenly split. People were calling it landing page optimization, website redesign. Some, some people were just calling it optimization, although that could be SEO also. Um, and so, you know, eventually the industry coalesced largely around conversion optimization, but it's tough then to like how you communicate and talk to about to a potential audience in your current industry. I mean, I think of uh, blockchain tokenization, decentralized assets, validators, DeFi, fintech, all of these words, you know, so how do you, what choose, which of those words to use or brand around a word or, you know, decide how you're going to communicate with this about this emerging technology and emerging ideas with an audience. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. There, there are a lot of words in this space um, that uh, that get used, sometimes used incorrectly, um, or sometimes used to as a you know as a way to take ownership over 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 a category or or an idea, um, hoping that it it creates some gravitas around it. Um, it. It's it's hard it's hard to pick the words and. You know, even if you do pick the words that you think have some gravitas around them, uh, still there's an audience that's not familiar with them, right? Because they're often very new ideas and new words. You know, so for for me, uh, it's often stepping back and just taking a look at where do I see this word being used? How regularly do I see it being used? Do I see it being used even outside of the the inner circle that's thinking about this and working on this every day, or or is a word not not there yet. Um, and, and that is often a starting point for whether I'll adopt a word or not. And then given the industry that we're in, um, and how new blockchain is to financial services, which is our, our core client base, how new it is to financial services. It's also taking a lot of time to define it over and over and over again. And, um, and that's good, right? Because, you know, again, doing my part of building up some gravitas around the word and making sure that people feel comfortable and understand the terminology and what I'm meaning by it. Um, but, uh, but it normally does start with those two things, you know, is there already some gravitas and particularly outside the inner circle and then, uh, and then myself doing, doing the effort of, you know, paying the effort of making sure that, you know, I'm helping to build up and educate people on that term. But there, there's a lot of fun ones like, uh, total, total value locked TVL, <laughs> new, ac- well, a host of new acronyms, right? TVL, right? Total value locked and people not understand what that means. And, you know, in the traditional asset management world, it would kind of be like assets under management, right? It's the, it's the assets, it's the financial assets that are locked on the chain as smart contract. So there's, there's a ton of stuff like that. Um, it's also what makes the space kind of fun. And this is why it's fun to be an emerging industry. Yeah. And an analogy, like you mentioned, like that analogy can help. Okay, you knew this thing. Yeah. Now think of this thing, and they're similar. So speaking of analogies, you mentioned, you know, you started at Cosmo.com. Uh, that was early days of the whole dot-com boom, which became a bubble and all that. I think they raised three or $400 million. It seems like we're in similar times, in a sense, with blockchain, crypto, artificial intelligence, now, wonder what you learned from your experience in the early days of the dot com bubble, and especially around this, because something I've noticed, you know, dot com early days. I remember being on forums; it was a very grassroots thing, right? Mm-hmm. And then it became ultimately a very corporate thing, right? Mm-hmm. And looking at kind of what you're doing with the blockchain and crypto, it kind of seems like it was a similar approach, like blockchain, crypto, those things. It was a very grassroots thing. You know, we heard about Bitcoin and those things, and now you're using it 
in, to me in a very enterprise fashion. So just wonder if you've learned in general anything from that, your time in the early days of the dot-com that could be helpful to people working in the next emerging thing, whether it's crypto or blockchain or artificial intelligence or whatever that is. Yeah, there, there's probably a couple of things that underscore that, you know, for me in terms of what I've learned. You know, one is um, these are all critical technologies, right? So yeah, it, there is stuff that, you know, the ups and downs, the roller coaster ride of the of cryptocurrency. I don't participate much in cryptocurrency, um, you know, as a speculative investment. Um, the underlying technologies, though, are what's interesting. And, you know, with uh, with Internet, if you think about it, transformed the way we do everything. I mean, even the way we're interacting right now is transformed um, literally right now in the spy gas. Um, but if you think uh, think about like what the dot com boom did with uh, with Amazon, you know, and the size of Amazon as a company today, um, you look at uh, industries that that totally shifted shape, right? I mean, Blockbuster gone, right? You know, so it, there there's I think there's um, there's there's these profound effects that technology has on on our lives, the way we do things, the way we operate. Um, blockchain is just that too. Um, and actually a lot of people argue it's even more of a shift than what internet brought to us. Um, but, and I won't argue that idea, but, um, but at least it is a shift like the internet, right? And when you think about the internet, that is the application layer that you're interacting with. So, um, and obviously there's, there's a rail of the internet, but but there's this interface that you're interacting with. In a lot of industries still behind the curtain, there's a lot of manual processes, uh, centralized activities where, where information's not shared, um, intermediaries that come into play to help solve part of the, the transaction process. Um, and, and one great analogy that I love to use is uh, if you think about trading a, a stock today, right? So you go, you want to buy a Tesla stock uh, and you go onto Robinhood or whatever brokerage you use uh, and you buy Robinhood stock. It appears in the interface shortly after you made that purchase, after you hit buy. Um, the reality is it actually takes two days to transact on the back end. So, so that settlement time is really long and that introduces a lot of risks, you know, that, that Robinhood has to be accountable for and all the intermediaries that help make that transaction happen are accountable for, but it takes two days. Now think about if you're a prime member at Amazon, it takes two days for you to hit buy or less sometimes buy and a package arrive at your doorstep. So why does it take two days for financial services to make a transaction of a stock? So these highly intermediated, um, what should be fully digital uh, services still have a back end and a middle layer that are not digital today. And so that's what blockchain brings. Blockchain brings this um, back end layer that allows things to happen in real time. And so it'll end up changing um, the way that we do things like financial services where, you know, you can really make a transaction in real time where you can truly own the assets that you buy, right? They can be in a digital wallet. It doesn't just have to be your cash and credit cards in a wallet. It can actually be a share of stock in your digital wallet that I could very easily give to you, Daniel, if we were passing on the street, we just, I hold up the, you hold up the QR code in your digital wallet and I send over uh, that share of stock. So, so there are these technologies that have these very, very profound um, changes on industries. Um, and blockchain is one of those similar to dot com. Uh, that, that's one thing I'll share. The, the second thing I'll share, and, and of course, there'll be waves to all these things in terms of adoption um, and time for adoption and when that right moment is. And that kind of gets me to the next point. The next point is um, knowing when the right time for that adoption is. And also uh, knowing how to pick the right place to be able to help encourage and drive that adoption. And so uh, for me, I started seeing blockchain 
and interacting with some leaders on blockchain space back in 2016, 2017, when I was at uh, Franklin Templeton. Um, I, I was very fortunate to be part of the, the committee that um, would interview uh, startups that we were considering to fund, to give some, some venture capital funds to, uh, and to incubate. And uh, being part of that committee, I got the opportunity to sit with uh, leaders of blockchain companies. And so I had the opportunity to learn a little bit about what was going on, what adoption looked like, you know, how they were seeing things coming down um, the path, how long it was going to take to get there. And um, and that that, gave, that was an important tool for me because I was able to assess you know, a couple of things. One, I want to be there doing that because I understand what this is going to drive. But two, I have the opportunity to be able to um, to pick the right time to go into the space. And and that that's that's exactly how I feel it's worked out. You know, I, I came into blockchain now about two years ago. Um, and last year, I feel like we saw the first material wave of institutional adoption, not for prototyping sake, but for actually using the blockchain. So bringing real assets on chain and tokenizing them, um, and that that's that I I I'm lucky I got to be here for for what is really the very beginning of that, and uh, and now these next few years I I think we're going to see a ton more activity coming on chain, um, in terms of picking the right place to go, you know coming I again coming out of financial service where I was at BlackRock and Franklin Templeton, um, you know. I understand that industry very well. And so it was very important to go to a place that I felt understands that industry very well. Um, because those will be the individuals that are going to have the most success driving that adoption onto their platform. You know, of course, you got to have a great product that we all believe in, which, which is a, another very important component of it. But having a team that really gets that industry who come out of that industry uh, with long tenors in that industry is, is another very important component. And so today, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate because I get to work on problems blockchain at a time when the adoption is just now happening and on the blockchain that has the most adoption of real world financial assets. Um, and we're actually technically the second largest blockchain in the world with, uh, with about 8.2 billion in real world assets already locked on chain. Well, then we've gone through your entire career from the early days in dot-com to now we just talked about blockchain. If you had to break it down, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? What are you looking for when you hire? What are you looking to be? You know, for, for me, it changes pretty dramatically by every environment that I'm in because, again, I'm trying to counterbalance, right? So it depends who's already there, who's not there. It depends a little bit on the culture of the company. It depends on what we actually need to go get done. Um, so so I think, I think skills vary uh, and there's there's um a little you know bit of a dependency on on um where we are that drive what i'm looking for but there are a few things that always play out for me you know one is um strong communication you know marketing you need to do a lot of communication it's not just outbound to customers it's within the company um setting the right priorities helping people understand why we're trying to take particularly with digital transformation, why we're trying to take things a certain direction. Um, so I am looking for very, very good communicators. Um, I'm looking for individuals who want to try and fail. So I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very easy to, to not want to take risk. Um, and, and it may be natural for some people not to take risk, but digital transformation, we need to take risks. We need to try things. And so for me, you know, ship fast, learn fast, evolve fast, right? And so I, I do look for people that want to take a risk and, and they're okay with that and feel comfortable doing that. Um, and then of course, uh, for me, you know, delivering is really important. And so I also look for people that have some history of, of delivering success, right? And that, that can walk me through uh, what it's taken them to and, and show the milestones, the difficult milestones that's taken them to get where they got. Um, but that can show me how they they walk through something, and um, and those are probably the the three things that um, are really really critical and core. And then everything else kind of balances out between you know what we got to achieve, where we are, uh, yeah, yep. 
Well, thank you for walking us through some of the key milestones in your career, getting us in your head and talking about how you achieved all that. I learned a lot today, Dan. Also, I appreciate the time, Daniel. This has been great. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com. Thank you.